Previously on Watch With Mike. I paid $10 for this watch, and I just thought this was really pretty cool. I don't know what those three colors are. It's red, yellow, and blue. It just kind of struck me as sort of nautical. Um, I can't even pull out the winding stem to move the hands just to give you a better view because this winding stem is frozen. So, $10 watch. Not running. This watch will be coming to the channel. Hi, I'm Mike, and the story of this vintage Benris DN2A is a perfect example of why I love watch repair and restoration. There's so many watches out there for the amateur watchmaker that need repair. Some watch stories can only be speculated upon. As I work on a watch, I create my own version of its history in my mind. The original owner of this watch must have loved it so much that he wore the heck out of it, literally because there's a hole worn into the rolled gold covered case where your finger rubs where you wind it. But having an open hole in the case didn't stop them from wearing it, exposing it to moisture, dirt, and eventually rust. This episode tells the story of finding and fixing the problems, and I share some real screw-ups, aka learning experiences that I made during the restoration process. You learn by doing, and by publicly owning my mistakes, maybe I won't make them again, or at least for a while. Two things before we jump into the repair. First, I have not repaired the hole in the case. The base metal is simply too damaged to weld from the years of exposure. Until I can find a replacement case, I'm considering using a dollop of epoxy to fill the void since it's out of sight and this isn't exactly a dive watch. But I've been wearing it and enjoying it, albeit in dry conditions. Second, I did the reassembly right after acquiring a new stereo microscope with a 4K camera. Wow, talk about an eyes-opening experience. The microscope has enough clearance that I can service the watch while looking through it and I already feel like it's making me a better watchmaker. Some of my blunders are now comically large and obvious. As always, I look forward to your comments and suggestions. Let's get to work. There we go. Let's see if we can get the back off. Oh, geez. Now I'm second guessing myself. Is this possibly a front loader? And it looks like there's a groove right there. Is there any give here? Yeah, yeah. So there is the pry point. There you go. Yes. Oh, and that's a good sign. I haven't seen the movement yet, but look how clean it is. And what do we have here? Goodness gracious, it's, it's actually clean. Thrilling. Yeah, that's just completely mucked in there. The success of this project really hinges on whether or not I can free this winding stem. So I'm going to loosen the setting lever screw, which in normal circumstances would allow me to pull out the stem by the crown. Anything? Maybe we can wind the mainspring manually. Maybe we can bump start the balance with a puff of air. Well, that's great news. I gave it a little bump and it started running. The pallet fork is ticking back and forth and the escape wheel is going. So that's very encouraging. That means that there's a really good chance we can get this watch to run. Excellent. We will start the disassembly in earnest by removing the hands using these pry levers that I made from extra spring bar tools. I'm using a dial protector so I don't damage the dial finish. Now I'm using a piece of plastic to protect the dial as I remove the tiny seconds hand. The dial is held on by two screws on opposite sides of the movement. 
I'll also remove the dial washer and hour wheel at this time. The gears and levers that wind and set the watch are called the keyless works. Everything here is dirty and some parts seem out of place. The first thing I will remove is the yoke retainer plate, which has a spring-loaded arm that makes the setting lever click into its setting and winding positions. It's dirty but fortunately intact. The setting lever is completely unscrewed from the setting lever screw on the other side of the movement. I'll relieve the tension on the yoke spring. The yoke rides in a groove in the sliding clutch, which engages the setting gears when the crown is pulled out. I'll use my most sturdy tweezers to remove the cannon pinion, which the minute hand attaches to. Next, I'll remove the minute wheel and pinion, the setting wheel, and the intermediate setting wheel. Under the microscope, we now have a clear look at the winding stem with the sliding clutch and winding pinion frozen into place. Yuck! Let's turn our attention to the other side of the movement. And there's a pry point right here. I'm going to remove the balance assembly, being careful not to damage the tiny pivots on the balance wheel and the delicate hairspring, which can easily be bent or twisted. The pivots on the balance look good. These metal plates are called bridges. This one is the train wheel bridge. The red pivot holes are synthetic rubies, which provide very low friction and can last a century or more. Under this bridge is the pallet fork. It has two low friction rubies attached with shellac called pallet stones. Everything appears in good shape, but I'll inspect all the parts under the microscope before assembly. The train of wheels transfers the power from the mainspring to the hands of the watch at a precise speed so the watch can keep time. I'm removing the escape wheel first, and we'll come back for the other wheels after removing the ratchet wheel, which sits on top of the mainspring barrel. You just saw the wheels jump, which means there was some wind left in the mainspring. This ratchet wheel is soaking in oil. That's not good. Too much oil can prevent a watch from keeping accurate time. I'm removing the second wheel, or center wheel, the third wheel, and the fourth wheel and examining the teeth and pivots as they come out. The crown wheel turns the ratchet wheel when you wind the watch crown. Most crown wheels are secured by a reverse threaded screw. Righty loosey, lefty tidy. There's also a crown wheel ring, which looks like a washer that sits on the post. The barrel bridge secures the main spring barrel which powers the watch like I've mentioned. Once the screws are removed, there are often pry points along the edge of the bridge. It's important to go slowly and loosen the bridge evenly. Never pry off parts using force. We can now lift out the mainspring barrel. I was expecting it to be soaked in oil, like the ratchet wheel, but it's pretty dry. The setting lever screw, which attaches to the setting lever on the other side, can now be removed. A little rusty, but I can still see the threads on there. Whenever you rebuild a watch, your first choice is that you can reuse all of the parts. If a part is badly damaged and if new parts were available, then replacement is an option. But for old watches, they can be very expensive or worse, completely unavailable. So the only thing left now is the winding stem, the sliding clutch, and that winding pinion. So we can see the end of the winding stem right here. Will it budge if I press? Nope. So the next course of action is going to be to get some kind of penetrating solution on here. It's 
it's alive, it's alive, it's alive. Then all of the parts in the keyless works and the main plate got a scrub down in naphtha with a fiberglass brush followed by a rinse in isopropyl alcohol. Okay, there's just a few more things to disassemble before all of the parts are cleaned. The main spring barrel lid gets popped off, and I'm using tweezers to make sure the spring doesn't fly out. I'll remove the arbor from the center of the spring, And then we're going to tease the spring out of the barrel one coil at a time, being careful not to distort or break it. So there we go. This is the click that engages with the ratchet wheel, which I've unscrewed from the barrel bridge. The click spring keeps the click in the correct position. I'm remounting the balance assembly in the main plate so it will be protected when I run everything through the ultrasonic cleaner. Before tightening it down, I use a puff of air to test that the pivots are safely seated. Now all of the watch parts are loaded into metal baskets with the smallest, most delicate parts placed in these tiny screened capsules. I clean my parts in an ultrasonic cleaner using LNR Cleaner. It's a three-step process where the parts get a five-minute bath and cleanser, followed by two five-minute dunks in a rinse solution. I'll put a link to my video that shows the process step-by-step step if you'd like to learn more. The parts have been washed and dried, and it's time to start reassembling the watch to see if we can get it to work. I'm going to put a light film of multi-purpose watch oil on the length of the mainspring, using a piece of watchmaker's tissue. We will add a little bit more oil later when it's back in the barrel. I'm using my Bergeon mainspring winder to coil the spring so I can insert it back into the barrel. While you can rewind some watch mainsprings by hand, the winder makes it easier and less likely that you will bend the spring. But I'm still learning how to use these winders and I got myself into a little bit of trouble. Oh, come on. My first problem was that I could not get the hook on the arbor to grab the hole in the spring, and the winder handle was just spinning. It was easier to see on the microscope. A gentle tweak with my heavy tweezers let me curve the spring just enough to grab the hook on the arbor. Once the hook's engaged, the spring winds easily. There's a little tail on the end of the spring, which keeps it from slipping in the barrel. You need to carefully tease the tail into the spring winder. Sometimes this doesn't go as expected. Despite being careful, no, the tail ended up on the outside of the winder. I carefully removed the winding arbor and assessed my choices. Fortunately, my winder was slightly smaller than the inner diameter of the barrel so I carefully aligned the tail and had enough room to seat the winder. I sure hope this works. Let's see what happens. Success! All right, cool. We got lucky. I'm going to engage the arbor hook on the end of the spring. Whoops. Found it. Second time is a charm. Here I'm placing some of my medium weight watchmaking oil directly on the coils of the spring and on the top of the arbor where it will contact the lid. When everything is aligned, I will use this barrel closing tool to snap the lid back into place. With one more dab of oil, the mainspring barrel complete is ready for reinstallation. 
under the microscope, it looks like there's still some residue on the balance, and the hairspring coils look like they're sticking together. A quick dunk in a solvent called One Dip dissolves any oil or residue that may still be on the parts. One Dip evaporates very quickly, and I'm helping it dry by moving air across it with my handheld blower. The pallet fork also gets cleaned in the One Dip. I did not run it through the ultrasonic cleaning process because I didn't want to take the chance of damaging the pallet jewels which are held in place with shellac. I think I made a mistake by not stirring my blue Mobius 9501 grease before putting it in my oil cup because it's not usually this runny. Here I'm reinstalling the click spring and the click. I used a piece of Rodico putty to hold the barrel bridge still while I installed the click and its click spring. It's a good thing I flipped it over and checked it because I had a wad of Rodico trapped underneath. I tried tweezers and another piece of Rodico to remove it, but it eventually required me to remove the click, clean it, and reinstall it. Another lesson learned. Some of the pivot jewels are two pieces. One jewel with a hole to accept the pivot, and another called a cap jewel that will hold a small amount of oil so the wheel always has lubrication. On this jewel, the cap jewel unscrews from the main plate. I clean it in one dip and then rub it lightly on the paper with a piece of pegwood to ensure that all of the old oil is gone. Then I'll place a drop of my lightest oil in the center of the cap jewel and reinstall it above the hole jewel in the movement. The balance pivots also ride in a two-part jewel assembly, which is held in place by two shock-absorbing metal springs. To free the jewel, you need to carefully unfasten the little tabs on the shock mount. This shock mount tips back like a little toilet seat, releasing both the hole jewel and the cap jewel. Both parts will get cleaned in one dip, dissolving and washing away the old oil. Like before, a small drop of oil is placed in the center of the cap jewel. You only want to cover about half to three quarters of the surface of the jewel. I didn't feel like any oil was coming off my oiler, so I went back to the well and loaded it up with more. Whoa! That's way too much! I tried lifting away a small amount of the oil with Rodico. I only made a mess of it. So back to the solvent for another cleaning and another attempt. There we go. Much better. Now the whole jewel is reunited with the cap jewel where surface tension will hold them together. Okay. Now I can reinstall the cleaned and oiled jewel assembly in its mount. Darn it, I'm using steel tweezers which left a scratch. Brass tweezers, a softer metal than stainless steel, would be less prone to scratch, but I don't own a good pair of precision brass tweezers. Hey Santa, are you listening? With the tabs on the springs secured, we can move on to lubricating and reassembling the watch. After applying grease to the friction points, I'll place the mainspring barrel into the main plate and drop the setting lever screw into place. I'll reattach the barrel bridge, adding lubricant as I go, and then reinstall the crown wheel ring and the crown wheel. Lefty tighty. It's finally time to reassemble the train of wheels, starting with the escape wheel. I'm not pushing down on the wheels, but rather letting gravity drop them into place while I carefully align the teeth on the outer wheels with the leaves on the inner pinions. Reinstalling the train wheel bridge can be challenging at times. You need to make sure that the pivots on all the wheels align with the jewels in the bridge and remain in their pivot holes on the main plate. 
Like before, if you use force, you can break apart. So you do this delicate dance of making micro adjustments and letting gravity drop the bridge into place. Sneaking a peek under the bridge can show you where the problem is. Using a loop or a microscope, you can see when the pivot is in the center of the jewel. When everything is aligned, the bridge and the wheels seem to magically drop into place. Oh, that's what we want to see. When I was confident everything was in place, I securely fastened the bridge and lubricated the pivots on both sides of the movement. I cleaned up any excess oil with Rodico and worked the oil into place by carefully turning the wheels. I greased the friction points and sliding surfaces for the ratchet wheel and the click. Placed the square hole of the ratchet wheel over the post of the mainspring arbor and lined up the ratchet teeth with both the crown wheel and the click. Next, I reinstalled the pallet fork and pallet fork bridge, being really careful not to damage the pivots. Yep, I think we got it. With a small wind in the mainspring, the pallet fork is snapping back and forth as it should be. By now, I'm really excited about getting this watch running. Before reinstalling the balance, I need to lubricate a small surface on the tip of the exit pallet stone of the pallet fork, which makes contact with the escape wheel. Darn it, that's way too much oil. Rodico to the rescue. I also had to clean a blob of oil off the tooth on the escape wheel. Once the right amount of oil was in the proper place, it gets distributed on the escape wheel one tooth at a time by rocking the pallet fork. After five teeth, oil is reapplied and the process is repeated until all of the teeth have been reached. The only thing left is to reinstall the balance and see if this watch runs. It does, and I couldn't be happier. This is one of the most heartwarming moments in watch repair. I manually put a full wind in the mainspring by turning the ratchet wheel with a screwdriver, and the watch looks like it's running strong. But then, I made a huge mistake. I tried to unwind the power in the mainspring by holding the click aside and gently letting down the mainspring barrel with a screwdriver. But my screwdriver was too small for the screw head, and watch what happened. The screwdriver slipped and was flung off, getting caught in the teeth of the ratchet and crown wheels, and leaving two scars in its wake. I was so mad at myself. Another lesson learned. There's just one more thing to do on the bridge side of the watch before flipping it over and reassembling the keyless works, and that's lubricating the shock-mounted jewel in the balance cock. The process is the same as we did on the other side. Remove the jewel, clean it, place a drop of oil on the cap jewel, reassemble the two halves, and reinstall it in the shock mount. Perfect. It's time to flip the watch over and install the keyless works, which wind and set the watch. Since most of the parts in the keyless works turn at low speed, I will be primarily using my heavy 9501 grease, starting with the sliding clutch, which is also called the sliding pinion. The winding pinion goes in next, with the directional teeth pointing toward the matching directional teeth on the sliding clutch. I am applying grease to multiple points on my rehabilitated winding stem. The setting lever is put back in place and gets fastened by the setting lever screw which is on the other side of the movement. I'll need to use my finger to hold the setting lever in place until the screw is engaged. Good. Next, I'll lubricate the post for the yoke.
the yoke drops into place and rides in the groove on the sliding clutch. The yoke spring then gets placed into its recess on the movement and compressed against the edge of the yoke. Okay. I've switched my medium weight oil and I'm pre-lubricating the remaining posts and sliding surfaces for the last few parts. The cannon pinion gets snapped into place. Then the minute wheel and pinion, taking care to make sure that the teeth are aligned with the cannon pinion. The setting wheel and intermediate setting wheel are next. Now we can attach the yoke retainer plate, which holds everything in place, pre-lubricating the arm that will spring load the setting lever, which in turn holds the winding stem in either setting or winding positions. With the retainer plate roughly in place, I will loosely fasten it down. Engage the spring-loaded arm on the post of the setting lever, there we go, and then tighten it down all the way. It's time to test the winding and setting functions to see if we got it right. Well, it's winding. <coughs> Whoops. The winding stem came out because I forgot to finish tightening the setting lever screw. So let's get them back in there. Okay, there's setting. Winding position. Hey, it looks like everything is working. I'm going to give the watch a full wind, set it aside until tomorrow, and then we'll put it on the time grapher to see how well it's running. As you saw earlier, this watch was in pretty rough shape. In addition to the hole by the winding stem, the rolled gold case was discolored and scratched, and the crystal wasn't much better. A short while ago, I made a video about using a hobby buffer to polish gold and watch crystals, and I used this Benris watch as my victim. In the video, I divided the watch back into sections and tried a couple of different buffing compounds to see which worked better. I did the same with the crystal, leaving an unpolished stripe down the middle for comparison. Here's a look at the back showing the unpolished section down the middle. Here's how the watch looked after I completed buffing the entire back surface. Respectable. I'm actually quite pleased. The buffer got me pretty far with the crystal, but I still felt I could do better. I love PolyWatch, and several applications really made this crystal very clear. Compared to where I started, it looks fantastic. I carefully cleaned each of the hands using this pen that has a buffing pad on one end. Remarkably, the hands were not in bad shape to begin with, and this gave them a little bit more shine. I was hopeful that I would be able to remove some of the marks on the dial. I tried a cleaning swab with distilled water, and I don't think it made a big difference. I tried the cleaning pen on the dial, and maybe it got a little bit cleaner, or maybe I'm being optimistic. Why don't we just describe this watch as having a lovely aged patina? I was able to get a little bit more shine on the gold hour markers with the buffing pen, knocking off some little bumps on the gold and clearing flakes of dirt that were accumulated between the markers. I came to terms with the fact that this dial wasn't going to look like new, and I made the decision to stop cleaning before I did any damage. Look at that. This is a good way to start the morning. With the minimal amount of regulating, I was able to get the movement to keep almost perfect time on the time grapher. The rate says the watch is keeping within one second per day. Amplitude is 300, which is strong, and BE, which stands for beat error, is 0.1. The lower the better, and this is very good. I'm taking this as a huge victory. It's time to get this watch back together and on my wrist. With a drop of lubrication on the cannon pinion, I can replace the hour wheel. The dial washer keeps the hour wheel in place by pressing lightly on the back of the dial. 
I will blow off dust as I go. Whoops, I blew off the dial washer. The dial is placed onto the movement with the dial feet posts on the back going into their holes and being careful to align the tiny hand at the six o'clock position. I tightened the dial mounting screws and installed the hour hand. But when I checked the dial for evenness, something looked off. The dial was sitting high, right above the balance wheel. There was a screw protruding on the dial side of the movement, keeping the dial from laying flat. Right there. It was the screw holding down the pallet fork bridge. I must have used the wrong screw, which meant that there was a corresponding screw somewhere else in the movement that I needed to swap. I found it. It's the screw holding down the yoke cover plate. What clued me in was that was the only screw on the dial side that had a brightly polished head. The screw I used in error on the pallet bridge was not polished. I switched those two screws, reassembled the movement, and reinstalled the dial. And this time, there we go. Everything fit perfectly. Hey, another learning moment. Now it's off and running. As I close up the watch and wind down this video, I want to thank you for coming along. I really grew fond of this late 1950s Benrus. There were times during this project that I didn't think the watch would make it, but it did and I'm glad to add it to my collection. From a fashion standpoint, the watch is a real chameleon, taking on dramatically different looks when paired with different bands. I hope you've enjoyed this video, and I encourage you to start or continue on your own watchmaking journey. I'm Mike, be good, be well, and be safe, and I look forward to our next time together.